Hello, gentles and ladymen. I'm Ulan Gaming, and today I'll be giving you a guide on how to defend yourself from rushes. Rushing is one of the most common strategies you will come across in the game, and it is specifically because not many people know how to properly defend against one. As soon as you're able to properly defend a rush, you'll find your ranked elo immediately increase, and you'll discover a completely different meta where everyone knows how to defend a rush and greedier strategies are the new king. Defending a rush is tricky because it involves a fair amount of competency and skill at the game, and a large amount of game knowledge of both you and your opponent's civilizations. You need to know what both you and your opponent's civilization are, are capable of, and most importantly, you need a certain mindset that can be difficult to attain. Defending a rush doesn't just mean being skilled in H2 either. It starts at the very beginning of the first age, and while we talk a little about the actions in age 1 that help against rushes, in particular, for a fuller guide on exactly what an age 1 should look like and what traps new players fall into, check out my video about all of that in the description and pinned comment. In HEMA, or and if not just HEMA, but for really all teachings of combat and martial arts, there's this idea and concept that for every span of time that you have to take one action, your opponent can also take one action, because you guys both have the same amount of time. As a result, the best fighting styles are ones that are capable of defending and attacking at the same time, which is why a lot of sword techniques and blocks allow you to both block or avoid damage while also performing a strike of your own in the same motion. Why this is relevant in Age of Empires is because the same concept exists here as well. In 5 minutes, you and your opponent are limited near equally in the amount of strategic actions you can take and resources you can use. Now, this is not referring to APM, or actions per minute, as that's more micro-intensive and a different beast altogether, but more so referring about the choice of how to spend the resources you own. A higher APM player will of course be able to attain more resources through use of Clever Micro, and there's a point where pure input speed in the game can overcome decision making skills, but that's not what this is about. If you're fighting somebody who is that much better than you at the game, you're probably going to lose no matter how good your decision making and allocation of resources are, and no matter what your strategy is. This video is not teaching micro tricks, but more so how to defend a rush against someone who is vaguely similar sk skilled to you through use of decision making. and. Uh, and and, and uh, skills and strategies that you can employ. Now, a rush is not free. Often, a rush with large amounts of units in an overly early amount of time sacrifices its, its economic capabilities in order to achieve this purpose and is not sustainable for very long. The rush is dependent on its ability to cripple you and your economy enough to a point where its own sacrifice and economy was worth it. For example, if both players are given 500 resources, a rush player may choose to make 5 units, whereas the other player may choose to make 4 units in the settler. This makes the first player temporarily have an advantageous position as he has the higher military power, but he needs to use it right away because if he waits too long, that settler is going to be used to get 600 resources to allocate next time instead of 500. By this logic, rushes attack early out of necessity and near desperation as they are on a ticking clock. This mindset is important because when you see a large force early on, instead of panicking in despair, you need to be calm and aware that in order to achieve an army of that capacity, your opponent is likely behind you at least a little bit in settlers and economy. This even applies to house booming civs such as Sweden and Japan and Britain, as while they are spending time building their military, that was time spent not chopping as much wood and not building as many houses. This mindset is logical to think about in a vacuum, but often that despair and panic upon seizing, seeing the size of the enemy force in your base at 6 minutes makes maintaining this mindset difficult. And thus comes the objective you need to achieve, not just, just, just to defend a rush, but to win against someone who is rushing you. Stop the rush while sacrificing as little economy as possible, and pushing back before giving the rush player the proper opportunity to recover their econo economy to your level. In that aspect, the number one objective in a rush is not to kill the enemy units, but to save your settlers and keep them both safe and working. And the first one, and, and the first and most important step uh, to this is performed in age one, exactly 12 seconds after the start of the game. I'm of course referring to herding. 
Most players are already aware of this, but going to the far side of the animal you are hunting and shooting in the direction of your town center will result in the herd of animals running towards your town center instead of away from it. Doing this is important for several reasons and benefits. The first and most important of which is that your settlers are closer to the town center, and if enemy forces or raiders show up, they have a much smaller walk to get into the safety of the town center. The second reason to do this is it makes a smaller walk for new settlers to reach the dead animals, thereby increasing the time they are gathering and lowering the time they are walking, resulting in more resources. This is a trick all players should be doing in every game, regardless of whether they suspect a rush or not, as even if there is no hardcore rush, it's likely at some point you will be raided by hungry hungry hussars looking for an easy meal. The importance of herding and keeping your settlers as close as they can as close as they can be to a garrison point cannot be understated. For this reason, lots of players opt to make outposts or new town centers at faraway hunts or resources before gathering from them. A small tip about herding: uh, no animal, uh, no animals will herd in any direction for the first 12 seconds of game time. So if you have a hunt already next to the town center and you want it to stay there, fully kill the first animal in the, fir in the first 12 seconds. Additionally, a herd of animals will only run away from gunfire once every 12 seconds. So when you shoot an animal, it's going to take 12 seconds before you can shoot it to make it run again. Uh, this is the time it takes for a settler to fire four shots. So if you mentally think to yourself that a settler could have shot four shots, it's time to herd that group of animals again. I prefer to think of it in these terms as 12 seconds is not an easy amount of time to mentally keep track of, but everybody shoots in these games, so mentally it's easier to keep track of 4 shots worth of time. Another part of Age 1 anti-rush play is identifying the rush before it starts. One way to help identify your opponent is to check your opponent's deck, which can be easily done by clicking this button on the top right and clicking on the flag of your opponent. Sometimes, and especially uh, by better and more skilled players, a shipment deck won't always be indicative of their strategy and will not give you very much to work with, as the deck will be well-rounded and it, it may be hard to glean answers from. But more often than not, you can get an idea of what your opponent is up to by taking 10 seconds to scan through their deck. What you're searching for is a deck with maxed out H2 cards and an excess of crate and unit shipments, often at the expense of upgrade cards depending on the civilization. For example, looking at this deck might clue me into an India Rush, whereas this deck might instead clue me into an India Fast Industrial. Because when you construct a deck, you want the majority of cards to be where you're going to be spending the majority of the game. Another thing you can look out for is a complete lack of any kind of economic cards at all, including factories in, such case, in, in some cases, such as this Mexico deck from MFD a very skilled player in our Discord server, known for his rushes and fortress play. Uh, you can also use checking decks as a way to see exactly what USA and Mexico in particular aged up with, since their age up options add cards to the deck. Overall, a quick peek into your opponent's deck is something you should do in every game. And that note leads right into the last Age 1 anti-rush tactic I'm going to talk about, which is scouting and what you can glean from it, both with how your opponent scouts and how you scout. A player who is rushing wants to waste a little, as little time as possible and will seek to scout your location as early as they can so that there's no guesswork to it. They'll also probably scout everywhere around you so they can watch hunts and look for dead animals. If you see explorer, that do, that does not mean that if you see an explorer in your base uh, extremely early into age one, then there's a possibility it's a rush. Granted, it does not mean that it's a certainty, but absolutely, the sooner it happens, the more likely it is. Spending a little time pushing settlers, uh, putting settlers into the town center to shoot and explore is well worth it in most cases. To either scare them off, lower their treasure gathering capability, or if you're lucky, kill the explorer and stop their scouting outright. Uh, do the same with enemy dogs, tame wolves, converted treasure uh, guardians, uh, other, and other such pests that scout your base. However, this has only been talked about enemy scouting, but you can use scouting to your advantage as well. A common misconception is that if you aren't rush uh, among newer players that I see, is that if you aren't rushing, you don't need to scout your opponent. But this is simply not true. You need to scout your opponent in a in every single game, no matter what. Uh, 
What this means, however, is that if you're not rushing, the ideal time to scout your opponent is a little bit later than it is for them. The best time to scout your opponent if you are trying to identify a rush or just ascertain what they're doing is between 3 minutes and 30 and the seconds and then hitting age 2. Uh, this is when they're surely in transition and spotting what your, uh, that your opponent is mining lots of coin may clue you into fast fortress play, whereas most rushes are somewhat heavy in, uh, in wood costs and you'll be more likely to see lots of wood choppers in transition if they're more dedicated to age 2 play. If you're lucky enough to be in their base when they reach age 2, you'll get to see what they aged up with as well, which could be a huge indicator. If they age with the governor and you see an outpost wagon and 200 coin, it's likely that you're facing a fast fortress, and if you're seeing 400 wood lying on the ground, they likely age with the quartermaster and are looking to spend more time in the second age. If you're playing against Portugal, then when they age, you can follow the town center wagon to see exactly where they place their second town center, which can equally be useful information. Overly defensive and boomy players will place their second town center in their own base, and more aggressive Portugal players will place it far away uh, by hunts or mines, possibly in the middle of the map to claim territory or secure a forward shipment point. If your opponent is Asian, you can use scouting to see with what they are aging by checking out the wonder. Uh, although you can't, the, the wonder is a question mark, you can often figure out what it is just by the scaffolding. Um, well before it's, it's done being constructed. Uh, overall, the, the, the point is, there, there is a lot you can gain from your opponent info-wise by knowing what to look for when you scout their base. You want to see what their settlers are working on, you want to see what things are arriving at their town center when they age up with. Uh, you, you're, you're looking for anything and everything, really. Uh, another golden scouting opportunity is if you find a forward settler. Keep near the settler and pester it, as it's probably going to build a forward military building, and you need to know exactly where those are going and what those will be. Scouting can also tell you which units your opponent is going to be making and which units you need to counter. For example, if you see an opponent starting with a stable, then you know that they are opening Hussars. If you see, like, 10 plus villagers chopping and nobody on coin, you can be reasonably sure they are making crossbows and pikemen. If you see them start with a barracks, there's a good possibility it's either crossbows, pikemen, or musketeers, and so on and so forth. If, through scouting and checking decks, you ascertain that your opponent is rushing, your focus for the foreseeable future is to buy time and protect your economy. If you are planning on doing a fast fortress, you need to either completely stop your strategy and adapt to your opponent, or slow down your fast fortress at the very least and turn it into a semi-fast fortress, depending on your civilization. What you want and need is to waste your opponent's time when they reach you by putting things in the way. For lesser experienced players, this will mean making walls, but do not fall in this trap as walls are rarely a necessity this early in the game and you should avoid making them, in, in, in general. You can use natural aspects and landmarks of your base in combination with how you position your buildings to make a makeshift wall doing the same job but saving lots of resources in the progress that can be instead used to help you uh, to help make you a force to defend yourself. If receiving small wood treasures, feel free to construct small lengths of walls to help fill in gaps, but try not to go hardcore walling and making it closed around you. Your opponent is not likely to attack you from behind, so putting walls there is not a priority. Putting walls and putting walls claiming large chunks of territory far away that you don't have the ability to quickly defend is equally wasteful in resources. So, in general, just try to avoid walls for the most part. Instead, think about your natural landmarks in your base. What is a coin mine, if not a perfect square that your enemy can't walk through and is also completely indestructible? That's better than any wall I know. This early in the game, you won't have the settlers. You won't have enough settlers to mine on the far side of the coin mine, anyways. So why not tie a house to it and turn it into a wall length? And why not connect it to this tree line over here by placing a market? This creates a makeshift wall uh, of infrastructure that you could hide crossbow or skirmishers behind to pelt at enemies while they are forced to either run around them, retreat, and attack from another angle or, worst of all, take the time to siege the obstacle on their way, incurring heavy losses. It's important to say, however, that without ranged units, this defensive structure is greatly lessened in its usefulness. 
Too often, I see a new British player form a long line or wall with their houses, only to make musketeers instead of longbowmen that have no more range than my units, which completely ruins the point, as all I have to do is shoot back. Here's an important question. What do you do with your settlers in town center when you're under attack? At the town center, there is a button at the bottom here that's shaped like a bell. Upon ringing this bell, all settlers within line of the TC will go to it and garrison themselves. Now, just go ahead and pretend that that button doesn't exist. The last thing you want to do is idle your entire economy. Remember that your opponent's goal is to halt your economy enough that it puts them far enough ahead their sacrifice economy doesn't matter. Clicking the bell is basically giving them exactly what they want. As such, you only want to garrison the settlers that are working near where the enemy attacks so that the rest can keep working, thus providing you with resources you need to make the troops to defend your economy and base. If the enemy is attacking from the north, manually only garrison the settlers north of the TC and keep everyone south working. It's important to sometimes risk your settler's safety in order for in order for it to gather resources, even if the enemy musketeers are only right on the other side of the town center. If the enemy moves from the north to the south, garrison the southern settlers as uh, settlers and eject the pre and eject the previously garrisoned northern settlers and get them back to work. As everybody knows, the TC gets an attack as long as it has settlers in it, and it gets more attack the more settlers are in it. It gets 9 range attack for every settler up to a cap of 90 damage at 10 settlers. This means that the first 10 settlers that go into your TC are not truly idle as they are providing firepower with, uh, from a very high HP building not easy to take down. Only settlers after the first 10 that garrison are truly idle. So if you have more than 10 settlers in your town center, it may be a good idea to drop them out, uh, out on the other side so that, you, uh, so, so that they can gather resources. Having 10 settlers in your town center is very powerful, however, and it puts your enemy taking constant damage as long as they are anywhere near it. And this is an important part of defending your base. However, you don't want to let your town center do whatever it wants. The town center will always shoot first at whatever unit is closest, and it will shoot only that unit until it dies, and then proceed to target the next closest unit and shoot that until it dies. However, this is rendered useless if it ends up targeting your op opponent's explorer or warchief, as these units have very large amounts of HP and provide very little damage for the enemy army, making them the perfect damage sponge for your town center. Uh, some players will deliberately try to get their hero in the base first for this exact reason, and if you notice your town center shooting the explorer, it's important to manually make it target another unit. In particular, try to either spot units that are already half HP and can die in one shot, or target units that counter your troops. For example, if my enemy is attacking me with musketeers and I want crossbows to defend myself, but in response the enemy ships three hussars, if this happens, I want the TC to specifically target the Hussars over everything else, because that is the biggest threat. If your Civ has some unique mechanic to help defense, then make sure you incorporate it. And then make sure you incorporate it. For example, I play a lot of Malta, and as soon as I spot my opponent is rushing, I start littering gunpowder depots all over the area in front of my base. A cheap way to waste large amounts of time from the enemy, while also being a very real threat capable of large amounts of damage to the entire military enemy, uh, army. I like to place one near my town center as well, as it allows it to shoot 10% faster, doing everything we talked about in the previous section 10% more effectively. If your army dies, or if the opponent's military is in your base and it's just bigger than yours, you're in a tough situation and can possibly lose the game, but there are ways out of it. A great anti-rush tool is your Minutemen, or your Militiamen, uh, if you're not playing USA. But Militiamen can only be called once, and so have to be used at the exact right time. They, of course, lose HP over time, so if you want them to do as much fighting as possible while they have HP, the last thing you want is for Minutemen to simply scare your opponent away, as you're only losing resources by burying, uh, by, uh, by buying the Minutemen and having them die out of combat. As such, when the enemy is committed and directly under your town center, this is the ideal time to call Minutemen. 
That said, you don't want to call Minutemen out by themselves, nor do you want to just train another batch of units or ship a group of units by themselves. If your opponent has five musketeers, and you march one musketeer at him to fight five times, you're putting five musketeers against his five musketeers, but he lost zero units and you lost all of yours, because they're not together. On the contrary, if you march five musketeers together to his five musketeers, the match will be much closer and come down to the last man. The same principle applies here. If you make five musketeers from your barracks and they fight ten musketeers from the enemy, and then pop six Minutemen afterwards, then you'll lose. But by waiting to click Minutemen so that they pop from your town center at the same time as your units pop from the barracks, Suddenly, instead of having 5 units fight 10 units, and then having 6 units fight maybe 9 units, you're having 11 units fight 10 units, and that is a battle you can win. Even better is if you time this with a shipment. The standard shipment takes 40 seconds to arrive, crossbowmen take 25 seconds to train, and militiamen take 5 seconds to be called out. So if your army dies, start by sending a shipment of, for example, 8 crossbows. Wait 15 seconds and begin training a batch of 5 crossbows from your barracks. And wait 20 more seconds before clicking your Minutemen from your town center. And then all at once, in the same second, you will go from having 0 army to 13 crossbows and 6 Minutemen, which is 19 units that your opponent was not prepared for and may turn the tide of battle in your favor. This principle can be applied in team games where you and your ally build a big force that's big enough to fight the enemy that's in your base before you engage him. Now, waiting to do all these pops is anxiety inducing because the enemy will not sit still while you do this. During the wait, he will seek your economy, he will burn down your buildings and potentially your town center, or, or he'll search for stables and barracks to burn down to prevent you from training, but this is okay. It's actually best to think of your building's HP as a resource to buy you time, rather than as an asset that you can't lose at any cost. Often, you may have to sacrifice a house or two, or even a barracks, in order to meet the needs of making an army altogether. As USA, I frequently put my state capital well in front of the rest of my town, specifically to buy time, as it's a building that entices people to burn it down even if the actual usable value it provides is rather little past the initial tech. Houses can be rebuilt with, econ with an economy that's alive, but a dead economy cannot be rebuilt. It cannot rebuild anything at all. The golden rule to take away from this is try not to engage the enemy in any fights you know you can't win, even if it means sacrificing your buildings in the process. It's better to wait until you have a larger force. Something to note is that when defending a rush, you cannot only be defending. After the initial wave, if the enemy hasn't given up, this is the time to make a few hussar and go raiding, or make five pikemen to burn down torps and shrines. It's forcing your enemy to split his attention and slowing his capability to bring his economy back up to speed. If your opponent pulls his army back to deal with the raiders, then you can destroy the forward base. If not, then you get free raiding access. Send the initial, uh, spends the initial wave trying to survive and getting the enemy to retreat and posture. But you can't let them posture. As soon as you survive that first wave, uh, you need to... It, as soon as you survive that first wave and you have any kind of force, you need to pressure them in some way. Raid, destroy the forward base, keep them trading with you, and even more importantly, keep the fight out of your base, as this is what will allow your economy to build up without being under threat or needing to be idled. Rushes are hard to beat and can be very frustrating, as sometimes even a small and minute mistake can cost you the game. But if you get the hang of countering them, uh, then your skill as a player will increase exponentially. I hope today's video gave you the tips you need to do exactly that. Thank you very much for watching, ladies and gentlemen, and have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the game. I'm gonna let it play out because it was pretty fun, actually. Yeah, you are you are playing far more competently than I was anticipating. I always forget that you're like a better player than me. I think that's true. One more time? I don't think that's true. <laughs> Cool.
Come on. Imenaso. Yes. Imenaso. I think it is. I've been so focused on the raids that I've been forgetting to, like, do anything else. Like, you know, keep my military alive on the front line. Or, you know, boom. Idiot villagers. <sighs> Stupid. Yeah! Oh, that was a beautiful surround. I'm doing my soul props for that one. Yes. Imenaso. Yes. Imenaso. Yes. Iwal. And you with the raids. And I mean being sloppy as all hell. My god, your musketeers are just a little bit faster than my my settlers. <sighs> I'm being sloppy as all hell. Me too, man. Me too. I really should not be getting caught out like this, but I am. Grandmaster, 
posizioni. Sidi. Ta'taliniam. Eva, ta'taliniam. Come on, man. yes, he will. Yes. He will, man. He will, man. Yes. Il giornata ta Italiniam. Cacciatrici. Hallo? Sì, menatrici. Menatrici. Aufgabe? Il giornata Taiba. Ja. Zimmermann. Zimmermann. Zimmer Zimmermann. Zimmermann. Bonjour. Sidi. Cacciatur. Cacciatur. <sighs> you like not being allowed to be near your, uh, your repairs? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Menaso. Yes. He won. Hey. Oui. Oui. Très bien. Yes. He menaso. Yes. He menaso. Yes. He won. Yes. He won. It's a second TC. Ready wall, yes, he wall. Hallo? Ja, Pen Händler. Il Junata Taiba. Bene, Ben Bene, Ya Talenia. CD? Ovviamente. Bonjour, Ya Talenia. Yes. He wall. He man saw. Yes. He was lion. Yes, sir. Let's start in a position. Give the steer. Commandment. He was avant. See, I've noticed you've gone on water because I see the fishing boat life bar is disappearing. Because I've been wondering how you're getting food since I don't see any dead hunts. Oh, 
Oh wow, five thousand. Yeah, quite a few, eh? Yeah, quite a few. Yep, and that's game. Nice. Oh, you had me on my toes there for a sec, not gonna lie. <laughs> there was one moment where you had a huge fucking military in my base, and I had like eight crossbows, and I was like, oh shit! <laughs> but the token half Hussar and then five Hussar popped out, and I'm like, oh my god, what if I like flank from both sides? Yeah. How many settlers of yours did I raid? Uh, you got a ton of idol. I don't know if you killed many. Uh, no, I you definitely killed, killed a good. Few. I definitely you killed, killed a good a chunk. Uh, yeah, no, my yeah, my initial raid. Now. My initial raid killed an entire group of French villagers that was on a hunt, and that yeah, was you, you didn't notice the raid until I was on a coin mine. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking now. You got. Nine in that first raid, four in the second, and five on the third. So yeah, uh, you got a total of eighteen. You got a good chunk of my villagers. You were ahead of me for a while up until that raid. Yeah, up until that raid, and then I, that you killed me with that raid. Like that was after that, it was solidly in your favor. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I ran out of hunts, so I was like, well, it's not safe for me to go out on any of the hunts that are forwards in the middle of the map, because that's where you are, so I might as well just keep collecting food and gold, since that's all I have, and it's better than collecting nothing. And so then yeah. I was like, you know, let me just make a shit ton of falcon heads. Yeah, I saw two, and it's like, oh, I've got three on the way over, I'd win that falc battle, and then I see two more come out, it's like, three more come out, it's like, ah, <laughs> that's over. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for watching ladies and gentlemen this was as ever a ton of fun to make uh if you enjoyed the video uh, please do consider subscribing it really helps the channel out and have a great day